measures we can take. Um, it's hard going towards the end of these programs because the picture that's been painted is not one that's very positive. Um, you had to put a picture of my son in there, Wenley. I'm like tearing up thinking about marshes. Um, it is a little doom and gloom. Um, the, the stark reality is that we're, we're facing a, a large amount of wetland loss in the future. I think that that's going to be somewhat unavoidable. Um, but I'd like to, to kind of, um, towards the end, offer up a few things that we're considering and um, methods that we're looking at to see what we can do to continue to preserve some of the marsh, marshes and marsh functions that we currently have um, and different things we're thinking about in terms of adaptation and how we're rethinking what we've traditionally done in terms of marsh restoration. Um, so that's what I'll be focusing on. Um, We've already heard a little bit, you know, Jim uh, had those great case study examples um, talking about um, opportunities for management and what can be done in the upland and thinking about where marshes are, are likely to migrate to, um, things like moving land use activities and removing barriers to migration. Um, I'm not going to focus on that tonight. I, we're going to focus a little bit more on those types of projects. We've already started working with cities and towns to implement those um, types of um, kind of infrastructure removal projects. We'll be talking a little bit more about those in the municipal workshops that are upcoming. Um, tonight, I'm going to focus more on um, what are the things we're thinking about within the marsh itself, our existing marshes today. Um, what are some of the methods and, and techniques that um, we're looking at in terms of trying to preserve function and extend the life and functionality of the marshes that we already have? Um, and those include things like uh, Wenley um, had a slide that showed um, things like dr uh, drainage improvements. Um, I'll get into that. Elevation enhancement has been mentioned. We've talked a lot about accretion rates and sediment supply. Um, and also the issue of our, the eroding um, frontal edge of the marsh. So what can we do to, to help address that? Um, so as, as Wenley mentioned, um, and Save the Bay has really been at the forefront of our marsh restoration efforts in the state. Um, but since um, you know, the, the late 90s, we've been talking about impacts to marshes, um, human impacts to marshes, and restoring those, those marshes. Um, to um, a more functional condition. And so um, traditionally, when we think of marsh restoration, um, we have thought of restoring tidal hydrology, so removing tidal <laughs> restrictions, removing fill, um, lowering the elevation of our, uh, of our marshes, ironically, um, that had been filled to create upland to um, convert them back to marsh, um, and things like management of invasive species. So those, those are kind of what we think of as the traditional marsh restoration projects. Since um, we've been um, looking at the results of this statewide assessment that Save the Bay has been involved in, um, along with our modeling efforts through SLAM, um, the message here um, has really been that sea level rise is going to be the overriding issue um, facing our marshes in the future. Um, that's not to say that there are not multiple stressors on our salt marshes. There are still multiple anthropogenic impacts um, affecting our marshes, things like nutrient enrichment, um, you know, water quality degradation. Um, but I think we're starting to view sea level rise as the overriding stressor um, that's kind of exacerbating all of those other stressors on our marshes. And certainly, it's one that is not likely to reverse itself. And so um, we're kind of focusing on that as the most um, pressing problem. And so what can be done? You know, is there anything that can be done? And, and how do we decide where to do it? About these projects is that they're fairly simple. They can be done with volunteers um, digging by hand and also with low ground pressure equipment um, that doesn't have a huge impact on the marsh and um, that's available to us through um, Department of Environmental Management through their mosquito control, um, mosquito abatement office. And so um, Save the Bay has done a lot of work working in cooperation with um, cities and towns, um, you know, conservation organizations to um, implement these types of projects. They're fairly small scale, fairly low cost. Um, it, is, it is kind of a temporary measure. We're, we're not doing anything to address the elevation, but again, at least we're kind of stopping that cycle of of standing water. And, and we know that it does, in some cases, have, have a positive effect of bringing back vegetation. 
Um, another strategy is to go one step further and um, actually increase the surface elevation of the marsh. And we can do that by um, actually placing material, sediment, dredged material, on the marsh surface, um, which is very counterintuitive for folks who are, have been involved in marsh restoration for a long time. If you talk about filling a marsh, um, it raises a lot of eyebrows, but we are talking about fairly thin layers of sediment um, to help the marsh to gain enough of that elevation capital so that vegetation can take hold. So we are, we're definitely not talking about raising the marsh to upland levels. Um, we're staying within that marsh, um, with that marsh elevation range, um, but really doing that by putting material on the marsh. Um, these projects vary. This is a technique that's been used more extensively in the south um, and mid-Atlantic. There have been many large-scale projects, some smaller-scale projects. So the intensity and the depth of material can vary. Sometimes there's planting that's done post-restoration, sometimes not. Um, but the goal and, and concept are, are very similar. This is something that has not been tried in Rhode Island, um, but I'll, I'll get to some examples of where we plan to try in the near future. Um, but this is a major project done by the Army Corps in Jamaica, Jamaica Bay, New York, um, a very extensive, um, this is not what we would call thin layer deposition. Um, as you can see, we're talking about full scale equipment. Um, this was really a marsh creation project. There was existing marsh um, and there was a uh, tidal flat that had once been marsh. You could see it on the aerial photos that had degraded um, and fragmented and eroded away. And so they came in with um, dredge materials and basically rebuilt the marsh. And this project was fairly successful. Um, you can see this was kind of the outline. I mean, that's a lot of area. Um, huge scale project. I believe the sediment came from New York Harbor. Um, it was a huge volume. Um, we're looking at something more along this scale. So this is, um, this is more of what we call, this is, says thin layer deposition. Um, the uh, application of dredged materials in a very thin layer, sometimes over vegetated portions of the marsh, um, with the idea that if you, you keep it thin, that the vegetation can even grow through in the next growing season. Um, but this is a project that was done in um, Delaware and they actually uh, created this dredge and um, this, uh, this hose to spray the dredge material. They, they built this um, contraption themselves. Um, and so the idea is that the, the material is sprayed, it settles um, to, to a, a relatively uniform elevation and then the marsh um, can persist at that, with that um, little bit of gain in sediment. Um, so obviously, and this is just another example of the same type of technique. So if we were to try this here, which we will be in the near future, um, this is more, most likely you know, more of what we would be talking about rather than the very intensive large equipment type project. Um, another issue you know, is the erosion of the marsh, marsh edge. And I just wanted to mention that um, the, the Nature Conservancy is trying to address this. They're testing out a methodology um, for living shorelines. So the idea would be to place materials that would um, buffer wave energy against the marsh edge with the idea that sediments could accrete behind the materials placed. So here we've got coconut fiber logs that are staked in an oyster shell in biodegradable bags. So the idea, this is, and this is the Narrow River, this is part of a uh, larger restoration project. But the idea is that you would see um, accretion of sediment and um, regrowth of the marsh behind that barrier. So that's addressing the, the frontal erosion, the erosion of that marsh edge um, versus the vertical um, subsidence. So how, I, you know, relating this back to the SLAM project and the modeling effort, you know, how can we use what we've learned from SLAM and how can that inform um, our restoration efforts? Um, and I think, you know, in three important ways. Um, one is pro project prioritization. Um, Jim showed you slides of the effort to do kind of a critical wetlands or critical parcels analysis. Um, that will be of great use to us when we're looking at potential projects. So we've already, that's kind of called out these wetlands that either have high value now because of their size or their bird habitat value, 
um, or upland areas that will have high value in the future potentially. Um, and so we can use that to kind of prioritize areas to focus in. And that's going to go into a statewide coastal wetlands strategy document, um, which really is going to address, you know, we do have some funding allocated for habitat restoration. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, we are not going to be able to do these projects everywhere. They are very intensive. They're fairly expensive. Um, so given, given all these factors, where should we invest our restoration dollars? And this um, critical in, um, wetlands analysis can help us to make those decisions. And it can all, you know, SLAM in general is showing us, you know, where are we in danger of losing these habitats um, and where will they likely persist in the future? So that can be, become a criterion for um, uh, project success and, you know, are we investing in a spot where marshes have the potential to migrate in the future? Um, I think another great value of these models is that it, it illustrates what will happen if we do nothing. Um, you know, showing that picture of the bulldozers in the marsh, I mean, these, these projects don't always look pretty when they're in process. Um, they're very intensive methods. Um, and so it's important to illustrate if we don't act now, this is what is likely to happen. And so at least give the information that, you know, if we're willing to lose this habitat, then maybe the do nothing alternative is the way to go. But if what we value is that salt marsh function in this location, then, you know, we can do the cost benefit there and say it's, it's worth making the investment and, and doing the project. So I think for me, that's, that's been a really valuable use of those kind of future scenarios. Um, I just wanted to show, so I talked a little bit about our, you know, we're developing a statewide strategy based on some of this information. This is just a great in, um, example of where that's already been done. Um, there's a document called uh, Blackwater 2100. It's from the Blackwater um, National Wildlife Refuge in Maryland. And they've actually done um, habitat prioritization using SLAM data. Um, they've got maps that show the existing habitats and they kind of make these pro projections using the SLAM model um, into the future. And that all goes into their criteria for management and restoration um, and their habitat restoration strategy. So that's what we plan to, to do here in Rhode Island. Um, Grover touched on this a bit. Um, we, we do have some funding, some federal funding to do some fairly large scale projects in the near future. Um, and I just wanted to go through those quickly. Um, you may be hearing about them. Um, some of them will be starting fairly soon. Um, the first is in the Narrow River Estuary. Um, that was funding that was from the Department of Interior to the uh, US Fish and Wildlife uh, Refuge System. And we're involved in that project. It will, um, there's a very diverse project team of several partner organizations that kind of came up with a restoration plan for um, the Narrow River and the refuge there. Um, the plan includes uh, several methods, one of which is that beneficial reuse. So we will be doing some dredging to create eelgrass habitat and using that material for thin layer deposition projects. Um, also, in other areas where that's not as feasible because of um, logistical limitations, um, Save the Bay will be doing these kind of runnel micro creek ex uh, excavation projects to improve drainage on other areas of the marsh. Um, and then that living shoreline um, picture that I showed you, that was a TNC project that's already been implemented on the Narrow River. and. Um, they're going to be testing slightly different designs of the same technique um, elsewhere in the estuary as part of the larger restoration project. So that's a fairly comprehensive, integrated, large restoration effort that's going to be done over the next two years um, that we are involved in. And again, this, this is outdated. This, this project plan has already been updated. But just to give you an idea of what a conceptual design would look like, you know, these purple cells represent areas that were considered for dredging to gain material, and then you have placement zones on the marsh where that material would be slated to be, to be sprayed. Um, again, this is changed. This is not the design, the final design, but just showing you what, what a conceptual design would look like. Um, and again, this is a zoom in of the SLAM map for the Narrow River at Middle Bridge. 
at the three foot sea level rise scenario and we can see the purple again representing salt marsh loss. So we can see the do nothing scenario here is extensive marsh loss. And based on um, you know, Save the Bay's assessments out here and the, and the wildlife refuge assessments, um, we already know that the marsh habitat is degraded. We're seeing all of the things that Wenli was talking about um, in these areas. So that's why um, they've been targeted for this, this project. And again, this is in particular an area that is um, very significant for sparrow habitat. So Fish and Wildlife Service, that's, a, that's a, one of the main goals of the project. Um, also, we um, submitted, CRMC submitted a proposal to um, a Department of Interior competition um, and got funding to do um, marsh restoration in the salt ponds region. So looking at um, implementing a thin layer deposition project in Ninigrit Pond um, and doing planning for similar projects in Kwani and Winnipeg ponds. Um, and so that was a collaborative effort between us, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Salt Ponds Coalition, Towns of Charlestown and Westerly, um, DEM, Save the Bay, um, a very collaborative effort. Um, this is just the conceptual map of where um, the dredging will likely take place and the potential restoration areas here. And again, um, this is the slam map for the three foot sea level rise scenario and showing extensive marsh loss. So this is the do nothing alternative in that, in that situation. And that's all I have. Thanks. A um, couple of questions for Caitlin, and I'd like to, while you're asking questions, to add, invite Art Gantz and Harvey Perry down to the front of the room to get um, some reactions from our local land managers. Questions for Caitlin? Yeah. I'll do here and then here. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, 